Luke chapter 4, and we'll read verses 31 through 44. Luke chapter 4, beginning at verse 31, reading in Jesus' name. And he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. And in the synagogue there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And reports about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. And he arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, and they appealed to him on her behalf. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her, and immediately she rose and began to serve them. Now when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew that he was the Christ. And when it was day, he departed and went into the desolate place. And the people sought him and came to him, and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns as well. For I was sent for this purpose, and he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word. Thank you that your word is true and trustworthy. Thank you that you have given us your Holy Spirit to open your word to us, to shine your light through your word into our hearts. And now we pray that as we meditate in your word, you will indeed speak to us. We ask Jesus in your precious name. Amen. You may be seated. I think one of the main questions that we need to ask ourselves as we walk through this journey that we call life is how do we make decisions within this time that we have on earth? What is the authority that we use to shape what we call our worldview. Our worldview is how we look at the world uh, and how we understand the world. Uh, and um, I'm hoping that uh, the place that we go is the scriptures. Uh, that's not true for everybody. Uh, if, you, if you do a quick uh, search of Wikipedia uh, for holy writings, uh, you will find 14 different religions that have sacred texts. Uh, the Hindus have texts, the Buddhists have texts, Islam has the Quran, Judaism has the Old Testament and also other writings uh, from the, the ancient rabbis. Uh, and then certainly Christianity is one of the primary religions that has a religious text. And then you'll also find that there are a whole bunch of other groups of religious people, at least 12, different uh, groups that would be labeled under New Age religion. Uh, and, I, and I wonder, where do they get uh, what they believe? Where do they find the text? Or what is the text that they use? Uh, and I think often in our society, and I don't know that this is particularly something new to today, but certainly it's very prevalent in, in our world today, is that instead of going to scripture, uh, we go to the sociologists or the psychologists, or we go to culture, uh, and we allow those kinds of things to shape uh, 
our worldview, to, to help us decide what is true and how we live out our lives, or we go to ourselves. Uh, and uh, Solomon said that there is nothing new under the sun. And you know, if we look back all the way through the generations of humanity, uh, we find these patterns repeated that people did what was right in their own eyes. Uh, and so, so much of our societies, and not just today, but always, have, have determined that right is what's right for me. And one of the big new terms out there is my truth. As if my truth and your truth are not the same truth. Uh, and, and there's a denial that there is such a thing as uh, an objective universal truth. So what I would like us to do this morning, uh, since it is my hope that we actually have this book uh, that we go to for, for revelation, to, know, to understand what the truth is, more importantly to, to get to know God, and even more importantly than that, to understand God's plan for us, that I'm going to suggest that, uh, not, not that there are just five, but I'm going to suggest to us five reasons that, uh, apart from God's gift of faith to us, that we can trust, that we can have confidence that what we read in Scripture is true. Uh, and, and you might use these in your conversations with, with the people around you who, who, I'm, who might suggest that, well, you know, I don't really know what to believe and I really don't know where to go to figure out what is true. So five reasons that we can trust that what God has given to us in what we call the 66 canonical books of the Old and New Testament are indeed true, trustworthy. The first of those is their amazing composition. So we have a collection of books. You know, we've, we've bound them all together in one cover most of the time, but it's a collection of 66 smaller books. And, and what's amazing about these 66 books, as we look at the whole collection together, is that they were written over a period of 1,200 years. So if we, we think that probably Job was the first of the books written, we, we don't have any specific proof for that. Uh, but in, if we try to put everything into some kind of timeline, it appears that Job's life happened sometime prior to Egypt. And, and the 430 years that the people of Israel spent in Egypt. Uh, we believe that God inspired Moses to write the first five books. But it's very possible that Job was written before that. And then as we go through the whole of the 66 books... We get to Revelation, we think that that was probably written some place, what, maybe year 70? Uh, we're not sure. There, there doesn't seem to be any reference to it, to the fall of Jerusalem. But we think it might have been after the fall of Jerusalem, but we think that John may have been about 100 years old or so when he wrote that. And it would have been the last of those books. But as best as we can figure out, we have 1,200 years for all of those uh, to be composed. Then as we look at that over that time period, we, we find that there were at least 40 different men that God spoke to, that God used. We call them the authors. Uh, even when we believe and understand that God is the true author, but that God spoke to those that he called to write what he wanted them to write. Uh, and, and we find this in a couple New Testament books. Peter references it, that, the, that men guided by the Holy Spirit. 
spoke God's word to us. Uh, or, or Paul talking to Tim Timothy talks about God breathing the scriptures to us. That's, that's the word inspired. We have a few English words that have uh, that same root that has to do with breathing. Respiration uh, has to, you know, that's breathing. And so inspired is God breathing his word into the authors that he used to write it. But we have at least 40. So over 1,200 years, 40 different men used. And, and we believe that it was probably written in three different languages. So we know that Hebrew is primarily the, the Old Testament language and that Greek is the New Testament language and that there are some texts that also may have been written in Aramaic, which is a cousin to Hebrew, uh, but was a, one of the languages of commerce uh, also. And it's very possible that Jesus and his disciples actually spoke Aramaic. Uh, that Aramaic was more common as a language than Hebrew, uh, that the scriptures were in Hebrew, and they're, they're close enough so that there's a lot of crossover between them. But three different languages, so 1,200 years, 40 different authors, three different languages, and here's the amazing part, one theme. That there is one theme that runs through all 66 books. And that as we look at the 66 books of what we call the canon, we find Jesus. In them all somewhere is Jesus. In the Old Testament, it's all pointing forward to Jesus. In the New Testament, we have the biographies at the beginning of the New Testament, and then the, script, the rest of the, of the letters and books that explain his life and the meaning of his life to us. But there's one theme, and that's what makes this, the composition of this collection of books so amazing. That God used 1,200 years and 40 different authors and three different languages, but all of them wrote to one purpose, and that is to reveal God to us. So we have the amazing composition of the scriptures. A second reason that we can trust the scripture is that it, it shows us the fulfillment of prophecy. That things spoken to us in the Old Testament came true. And even things, I think, in the New Testament come true. That, that there are things spoken hundreds of years before they happen, and then we see their fulfillment so if something, if, if we are told that something is going to happen and then it happens, I think, you know, that gives it validity. And I have, there's, there's uh, like 300 and some Old Testament prophecies that people have identified that came true. But I think there are three primary ones for me that I've identified from three different sections of the Old Testament that are fulfilled in Jesus particularly. Psalm 22 is certainly uh, an amazing picture of what happens on the cross. Uh, the, the psalm begins with the words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which are the words that Jesus, not the only words, but some of the words that Jesus spoke from the cross. And then there's a graphic description in the psalm of the crucifixion. And events that happen during the crucifixion. The mocking. The gambling for his clothes, the casting lots for his clothes that are in that psalm. And as you read Psalm 22, it's like you're reading a description of the crucifixion. Another one is Isaiah chapter 53. Particularly, there's a lot of prophecies in Isaiah, but 53 in particular is another one of those places where we look at and see the crucifixion burial and resurrection of Jesus. That chapter, we call it the chapter of the suffering servant. And it's the chapter that mixes both what happens on the cross spiritually with what happens on the cross physically. That Jesus takes our iniquities, our sin, upon himself. That because of the stripes, 
that he suffers, the beating, the, the whipping that he suffers, and the death that he suffers, we receive forgiveness. That his death is for us. That he is buried. And that he is raised again for us. And as you read through Psalm 53, uh, I, I don't know how you can read it without experiencing the, the crucifixion, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And I have these just kind of in order of, the, of how they appear in, in the Bible. And another one, Zechariah chapter 9. Uh, this is the, the prophecy of the triumphal, what we call the triumphal entry. When Jesus came into Jerusalem riding on the colt of a donkey a week before the crucifixion. And Zechariah tells us very specifically, your king will come to you riding on a donkey. And so we have these prophecies in the Old Testament that are fulfilled. Most of them fulfilled in Jesus, but others also fulfilled in history. And so an amazingly composed book, fulfilled prophecies, and then what uh, has sometime, sometimes be called the evidence of the shovel. Archaeology and geology point us also to the truths of Scripture. And, and uh, in my study Bible, my NASB study Bible, at the back of the Bible, uh, there are 11 20th century archaeological discoveries listed that point us to the truth of Scripture. That this is not just a fairy tale. That this is not just something people have dreamed up and, and written stories. But that these discoveries in archaeology actually point us to things that Scripture also speaks of. To verify for us that what was written in the history chapters of scripture actually are part of history. And I've, I've just picked out three of those for us this morning. One of, them, one of them is excavations of the city of Ur. So when we look at the whole history and the beginning of the people of Israel, we read that God called a man and his wife, his name was Abram, and her name was Sarai, and they lived in the city of Ur, uh, which is Mesopotamia. Today, that would be uh, Iraq, Kuwait in that area. But archaeology has discovered that city and dated it to the same period of time to show that when scripture identifies that city as the original home of Abram and Sarai, that it adds reality to their being. Because the city where they lived is a real city that really existed during that period of history. The other two are, are probably ones that we haven't really heard of very much, but they're kind of amazing. Uh, another, another set uh, of, or another piece of discovery, another archaeological discovery are, are texts from a city called Ugarit, which is in, today is in Syria. But what those texts do is they expose the reality of the Canaanite cults. So as we read the history of the people of Israel, we read about the gods of the Canaanites and how, how it seems that God had given the people in Canaan, which would, which would become Israel, uh, a chance. We know that the, the high priest Melchizedek lived there during the time of Abraham, that he traveled through that time, that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all lived in that area, that they all worshipped the holy, the one holy God, and so there was opportunity for the people in that area to, to worship also the one holy God. But as we look at the texts, the historical texts, we see that God 
gave them over to destruction because of their disobedience. And as we read the texts that were discovered at Ugarit, we see that the writings, non-biblical writings from that same time period, tell us about the gods of the Canaanites that are spoken of in Scripture. Asherah poles and the Baals and all the wickedness, Molech. Some of you may have seen recently after the laws that were recently adopted in New York, uh, pictures of a statue and people offering their children in fire to the statue. And that was part of the worship of the Canaanite peoples. And these texts from Ugarit reveal these base worship practices of the people of Canaan, who even offered their children in fire to the god Molech. And the scripture speaks of these things and it's corroborated by these other texts. The third one that I've chosen, another one that we've probably not heard of very often, are called the Elephi Elephantine Papyri. And, and this is a group of writings. This papyri is, is uh, paper made from reeds in Egypt. And these are texts that were found in this island uh, in the Nile River that was a, a Jewish military colony during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. And the text corroborates the things that happened under Ezra and Nehemiah. The return of the people of Israel from Babylon to Israel and the rebuilding of the temple under Zerubbabel that we read about in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And so we have evidence from outside of scripture showing us that these historical events from scripture that we read about in scripture actually did happen. And so archaeology and geology point us, can point us to the truth of scripture. That scripture can be trusted for, for its truth. The last two are maybe even more significant. The, the, the fourth of the reasons we can trust the scripture is that Jesus trusted scripture. Jesus used scripture and spoke scripture as truth as he taught. And we talked with the children this morning about that authority with which Jesus spoke. And the people of his day recognized that there was something different about him and his teaching that he taught with authority and they were amazed by the authority with which he taught and we see that often he quoted scripture as part of that authority so if jesus believed that the scriptures are true certainly we can believe that the scriptures are true now i don't know uh which translation of the Bible you use because the, the translators and the editors of the Bible do things a little bit differently. Uh, and uh, for example, my study Bible is the New American Standard. I, I read from the, the New English Version or the English Standard Version, yeah, English Standard Version, the ESV, uh, for church, but I use the New American Standard which is a higher level translation. It's like translated at a 12th grade reading level. But one of the things that the authors have done or the editors did in that text is they capitalize the Old Testament quotations so that you can, I can take my New Testament and just kind of, you know, thumb through it like this and just see at a glance every time that an Old Testament passage is quoted because it's in capital let all capital letters. And then, and then my study Bible also happens to be what's called a red letter edition. So the words of Jesus have been put into red. So as I thumb through the Gospels, then I can see just quickly, visually, the words that Jesus spoke and are recorded by the Gospel writers and then look for those capitals sentences in all capital letters and find Old Testament quotations. And again, I've identified three of those for us. There, there's, you know, lots and lots of them through the four Gospels. But Jesus used scripture 
in the temptation in the wilderness. Now, for some reason, in our cycle of texts this year, we skipped that text. Uh, probably because we happened to have Sundays that landed on the festivals of the baptism of Jesus and the, and the presentation of Jesus at the temple and the baptism. And so those were the texts for those Sundays. Uh, and then somehow we skipped the temptation texts. But if we look at the temptation texts, we find Jesus refuting the devil in the temptations by quoting scripture and by saying to the devil, it is said, and then he quotes scripture, for example, man shall not live by bread alone, or you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And he quotes scripture at the tempter using the authority of scripture to resist the temptations. A second place uh, we see it is in Luke chapter 4, which is the text for last week. So if you, haven't, if you want the sermon from last week, go to Facebook. I, I did a live podcast on Facebook and kind of walked us through the text uh, from, my, from my desk at my computer. But Jesus went to the synagogue on that Sabbath and he was handed the scroll of Isaiah the prophet. And he opened the scroll and he read from the prophecies in Isaiah. And when he finished reading, he said to the people, today this scripture has been fulfilled. And so he applied the authority of the scripture to his own life and his ministry and the purpose for his coming. But he quoted scripture as authority. Luke 22 is another example. In Luke 22, Jesus quotes from Isaiah 53 about himself. Talking about the fact that he suffered because of our sin, so that we could be forgiven. And he specifically quotes from Isaiah 53 and in the text itself applies it to himself as authority. So certainly if Jesus understood scripture to have that authority, then we can also rely on scripture being authority for us. And then finally, number five, Scripture changes lives. We saw the words of Jesus change lives in our text this morning. The man who was demon-possessed, Peter's mother-in-law, the multitude of people that were brought to him for healing and relief from demon possession. So in, in, in the Gospels, we see over and over again, how Jesus' words change lives. Gideon's out here? Any Gideons? Yeah, we've got one, two. Okay, you guys know the stories. And, and every time we've had Gideons, they tell us the stories. And there are thousands of stories of people who have picked up the scriptures and read them. And it's prevented them from committing suicide. It's changed their lives. It's saved their marriages. It's saved their families. It's brought them into a relationship with Jesus. And over and over again, we see examples of how Scripture changes lives. And so I would hope also then that that is true for us. That as we have committed ourselves to be a gathering of believers who function together with the Word of God, with the, with the Bible as our foundation, that we would go to it faithfully and allow God to speak to us through it. And that more importantly than all the history and everything else, that His story would be personal for us. And that Though he was a great teacher and a miracle worker, 
we would recognize that the whole purpose of the story is to show us our sin, to bring us to repentance, and comfort us with the forgiveness of sin. That the reason Jesus came was not just to teach, not just to do miracles, but the reason Jesus came was to die on the cross for us. To shed his blood that we might be washed clean. That our sins might be forgiven. And that we would be brought into a new and personal relationship with the creator of the universe. And it's my prayer that we would live in the faith that the scripture is true. That God's word is true. And that we can have confidence that when God says he forgives our sins, he does. And that God, when God says he sends his Holy Spirit, he does. And that when God promises us an eternity in his presence, we can trust that that is true. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that you have preserved for us the scriptures. And we ask that you would give us faith to place our full confidence in what you have spoken to us. And that there, above all things, we would see Jesus and have full confidence in the forgiveness of sins and life everlasting. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.